Professor College to give uh, a talk in the Science Festival. For many years, I used to receive this call from Professor Nasimaya. He would not introduce himself, but you could immediately hear from his voice, you know who it was. And the only alternative that one had was to say yes. Now, after Professor Nasimaya left us, Dr. Ramarao has been following the same tradition. He will never say who he is. He will call. He will call early in the morning so he, you know that uh, you are there. And I have always found it easier to say yes than to say no. So I come back every year. But the major problem that I have had in coming back every year is, of course, people won't remember what you said in the previous year. But you must still prepare something that is different from what you said uh, in the past year. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question uh, before I start. Uh, how many of you read the Times of India? Wonderful. I don't know whether you saw today's Times of India, but usually the newspapers for a long time, if you see a full page advertisement, it's usually an advertisement which has a picture of a politician and all their achievements of their government or something like this. But today there is a full page advertisement in the Times of India which does not have any picture on it, but is by a company called Data Genetics. And uh, it asks you to go and check out their website. And I have been noticing advertisements from this company, Data Genetics, for the last few weeks. And they are carrying out a campaign to promote the use of genetic methods in medical diagnosis. And I believe it would be, presumably they imagine that this would be a commercially viable uh, proposition, even in India, in the future. Therefore, I think it's very important for the general population to have an understanding of where biochemistry is, what are genes, what are proteins, and what really is the language of biochemistry. Because as you can see from my first slide, I'm actually, I'm quoting from Arthur Conberg, who died some years ago, is a very famous scientist, a Nobel laureate. He discovered some very key processes in understanding the biochemistry of DNA. He was also a scholar. So he wrote this article very late in life entitled Chemistry, the Lingua Franca of the Medical and Biological Sciences. Many times after I have given a talk in the Bangalore Science Forum where I meet some students outside, they are sometimes confused as to whether the subject that I have talked about belongs to chemistry, whether it belongs to biology, or occasionally whether it is a part of physics. Now the problem with modern science is that all these disciplines are in fact interconnected in uh, a wonderful way. And Kornberg was worried that even at the research level, the cultures of chemistry and the cultures of biology at the level of research were drifting apart. This is something that I have seen even at the Indian Institute of Science. The chemistry departments and the biology departments will not be as close to one another as one would like them to be. Because this is how these disciplines have traditionally descended. Sometimes disciplines of science are also like religion. It is very difficult to ask scientists to be secular with their science. And uh, in fact, I think the word secular should in fact be used in science also so that you don't make too many distinctions between uh, uh, physics, chemistry, biology, computer science. And today, for example, biology is probably, as I will show you, closer to computer science than some of the other disciplines. What Conberg suggested was that the rift between the two cultures of chemistry and biology might derive from the apparently more right brain dominated character of biologists and left brain dominated character of chemists. What he said was that neuroscientists have often felt that the two halves of the brain control two different aspects of our thinking. For example, the left half of the brain usually is 
of for more analytic functions. And the right half of the brain is for the more creative uh, functions. So artists, for example, they use artists, poets, authors, they use more of their right brain when more analytical people might use more of their left brain. And he suggested that the biologists may be using more of their right brain, whereas the chemists are using more of their left brain. So there is in fact a rift which now needs to be bridged. I'm going to talk to you about genes. So I will give you a small introduction to DNA. Now everybody knows that DNA is the genetic material. DNA is the genetic material because all our cells contain DNA. And it is the DNA which actually contains the program for everything that a living cell really does. And DNA is a molecule. Everything in life really is, uh, is composed of atoms and molecules. All of matter is atoms and molecules, and therefore, however much one might dislike the subject, there is no getting away from the fact that everything belongs to chemistry. You can't produce a material, and I've talked about this in previous years, you can't produce a material which does not contain atoms and molecules. And therefore, chemistry is the subject which studies atoms and molecules. And therefore, when we study DNA, we are studying biology, but at the same time, we are also studying the chemistry of DNA. This is the famous double helical structure of DNA. It is two long polymer chains which are intertwined around one another. And this provides a mechanism immediately when you see the structure of inheritance. Because when the two chains unwind, and each chain acts as a template for making a second chain exactly like itself, then of course you have what is called the replication of DNA or the transmission of information in biology. We are all familiar with the transformation, with the process by which information is transmitted in biology. Because which of us has not seen a newborn child and immediately said it looks like the mother or looks like the father. Actually most newborn children look like neither. <laughs> but uh, it takes a long time for the characteristics to appear. But it's conventional immediately to decide that characteristics have been transformed. What the biologists call the phenotype has been transformed from the parents to the children. This is something that whether they are educated or uneducated, literate or illiterate, this is something that we know. The fundamental mechanisms of transfer, of course, lie in DNA and lie in the molecule of DNA. The molecule of DNA is a long polymeric molecule which contains a set of atoms which are repeated endlessly along its length. And it's a very, very, can be a very, very long molecule. But you can see this ladder-like structure where the two chains are held together. The chemistry of this linkage or the rungs of the ladder are these kinds of elements, little elements of structure, in this case the base adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, which we abbreviate as the letters A, T, G, and C. They, they are interacting with one another by the forces between atoms which are called hydrogen bonds. There are two here and there are three here. The result is that the letter A pairs only with the letter T and the letter G pairs only with the letter C. This is what is called Watson-Crick base pairing and when Watson and Crick first built this model of DNA, it was really the most beautiful structure that had ever been seen because when you looked at the structure, you immediately understood how genetic information could be transmitted at the level of molecules. The chemistry of heredity became apparent when you looked at the double helical structure of DNA. And the key to the double helical structure of DNA is this very specific pairing which form the rungs of this ladder. What it means is that if I 
pull the ladder apart and I get two individual poles. And if I want to build another ladder, I have to build it in exactly this complementary fashion. Wherever I have an A, I will have to put a T. Wherever I have a G, I will have to put a C. So I have a mechanism now for copying. And once I have a mechanism for copying, I have a mechanism for transmitting information. This is what it would look like if I simply wrote down a stretch of DNA, A, T, G, C, and repeat it. And so this would be the way this track would be linked. Now, of course, in biochemistry, all the action in biochemistry inside your cells is carried out by proteins, not by DNA. DNA stores the information. This information is translated into protein sequences, and proteins carry out all the biochemical functions in the body. Now, all of you would have come across proteins primarily in a nutritional sense, where one would have been told uh, from an early stage that it's good to have diets which contain a substantial amount of protein. Of course, diets must contain a substantial amount of all the other things, including carbohydrates, because we need it. But I will show you later on, molecules get converted into other molecules by the processes of metabolism which go on in our cells all the time. But what really happens here is, if I have a sequence of DNA, this is now translated into a sequence of amino acids and proteins. The amino acids again are small building blocks just like this one, which are put together in a polymeric structure. Here I have four letters. We don't have to worry about the chemistry, we only have to worry about the letters. So the moment we worry only about letters, we are, have entered the subject of language. We have entered this we can now ask questions about what does a string of letters mean? Now, if there's a string of letters in English, or in Kannada, or in Tamil, or in Hindi, those of you who know the language would immediately be able to decipher what that string of letters means. But you can also write down another string of letters which may mean nothing, which may just be nonsense. But you have the ability to distinguish between sense and nonsense. And very few of us pause to think of how do we make this distinction. If we didn't know anything at all, how would we actually make this distinction? Now the problem is that in 1953, Watson and Crick produced the structure of DNA. In the 1970s, another revolution took place in biology whereby if you isolate DNA, you could now determine the sequence A, T, G, C along DNA. By the year 2000, one could sequence all the letters which are there in the human genome. And many of you will recall that around 2000, 2001, there is this famous picture of Bill Clinton and by his side are two scientists announcing that the human genome has been sequenced. At that time, the newspapers carried the headlines the next morning, saying that the book of life is now available to be read. Now, unfortunately, what happens with the book of life is that in order to read anything, we must first have a vocabulary, we must know grammar, we must know punctuation, and these are the things which are taught to us when we are in school. Now we have the string of the scientists now and the string of letters of the human genome and therefore they must now learn the rules of reading the string and then translating this into useful information. But if you do read the string and you are able to isolate genes, genes translate into proteins which now are sequences like this. I have used a three-letter code here, but I could just as well have used a one-letter code. So I can go from one polymeric sequence to another polymeric sequence. There's only one small complicating factor, and that is that if the DNA sequence has a four-letter <coughs> alphabet, A, T, G, H, C, the protein sequence has a 20-letter alphabet. It has six letters in the infuse alphabet which do not exist there, but the other 20 letters are there. And proteins exercise all their biological functions by forming complicated 
three-dimensional structures, which I will show you in a moment. But effectively, what we want to do here is to learn the grammar, the punctuation marks, the start and stop symptoms. You can imagine, uh, I can say this easiest with respect to punctuation in English. If you remove the, the full stops from uh, a page of text that you were reading, then of course you would find it very difficult to read. And uh, you have to put them back. Now if you have to put them back, then you would really have to understand the meaning. And so you need a lot of information. <coughs> you need a lot of prior knowledge. The same thing is true here. We would need to understand what is called the grammar of faulty. This is still an unsolved problem in biophysics. This problem is being solved, has largely been solved, but it is still difficult to interpret all the information which is present in genomes. But in the late 1960s, the genetic code became available. The genetic code allows us to translate from the DNA alphabet to the protein alphabet. And this one of the persons involved in actually uh, establishing the genetic code was uh, Professor Hardobin Kramer, then working at the University of Wisconsin, who did much of the experimental work and also did much of the early chemical synthesis of genes. He received the Nobel Prize in 1968, but uh, he did this remarkable work which forms the foundation of what we know today in biochemistry. Now, of course, that means that if I have a code, a genetic code which uses three letters to code for one letter, I have four letters now coding for 20 letters, I use three of these to code for one letter. I have the flow of information from nucleic acid sequence by translating protein sequences. Now, of course, in my own institution and in many institutions in India and possibly in many institutions are definitely in Bangalore, if I wrote down CNRR, what you would think of is you would think of this man. Because those are the initials of Professor C. N. R. Rao, who is the only scientist now, living scientist, with a Bharat Ratna. Now, I made this slide where Professor Rao asked me to give a talk in the JNC. I thought the easiest way to explain uh, the flow of information was to say that if you write C. N. R. R. and if you, are, if, if you ask me, because I know Professor Rao, I might think of it. But if I didn't know Professor Rao, I would immediately think of this amino acid sequence. Because C is the abbreviation for this, N is the abbreviation for this, and R is the abbreviation for this, which would now translate into the skeletal structure. Now this skeletal structure can take many shapes. Now if I have Professor Rao smiling, I could have one shape. If I have Professor Rao frowning, I could have another shape. This would be what you would now call a structural change and effectively the molecule would now be expressing a different kind of function. So we must think then of molecules and shapes the same way as we think of other objects, uh, living objects around us because molecules are to some extent alive, moving, changing, uh, changing their structure. But when I say a polymer, this is what I mean. It will be a string of letters all covalently linked together so they can't get away from one another and eventually folding up into something more complicated. If one uses the technique of crystallography, one can take proteins, grow them into crystals, shine X-rays through them, get a diffraction pattern, and then go back and work out the arrangement of all the atoms. And then use convenient representations to show them. So this is what a complicated protein molecule would look like if you look at its skeleton. When I say look at its skeleton, remember that if you, next time you go to a medical college, when you enter, I have never seen a medical college which when you enter, did not have on one side a big board which gave the names of all the principals of the college, 
and exactly facing them would be a skeleton. <laughs> and uh, that skeleton would tell you, and at the skeletal level, by and large, large numbers of human beings look alike. Very, very short human beings who look different from very tall human beings and so on. And by and large, at skeletal level, you will be able to classify uh, animals into relatively small number of groups. And that's why, although we have large numbers of shapes in biochemistry, biochemists prefer to show what is a skeletal representation of a polymer which has gone around in three-dimensional space. But I want to go back to biology. This is an old paper, and uh, this was written by an evolutionist, John Maynard Smith. He wrote this in the 1970s. Very easy paper to read, simply because it's only written in English. All the old papers are very good, because it's just written in English. Anybody can read them. Uh, there are very barely any formulae, there are no equations, there's nothing. And Maynard Smith says, natural selection and the concept of protein space. As soon as we hear the term natural selection, whom do we think of? We think of Darwin. And Darwin actually suggested, uh, although later on Darwin has been misinterpreted enormously by using the term survival of the fittest, Darwin never meant survival of the fittest. Uh, there is this uh, famous poem uh, uh, by Tennyson in English language uh, which says, nature read in true tooth and claw. What it interprets is, it's an interpretation of what Darwin said, that it looks like in biology every animal is trying to fight with every other animal, kill it, and survive. And this is what was called survival of the fittest. Political scientists, especially those uh, of communist origin, liked this interpretation of Darwinism very much at the beginning of the 20th century. Because survival of the fittest was a doctrine which could be translated uh, into human affairs quite easily. So Darwin has been interpreted by economists, uh, been interpreted uh, today, for example, by market economists, uh, been interpreted by polit politicians, uh, political parties, and been interpreted by biologists. So there are many interpretations of Darwin. But natural selection is a wonderful concept. It's the concept of, on which all of life and all of biology really rests. And all that Darwin said was that organisms are selected on the basis of their abilities to survive and reproduce in the environments in which they find themselves. And this is very, very important. Today, for example, when we have the spread of antibiotic resistance organisms, what it means is that if we keep on taking antibiotics, we eventually select for a population of organisms which are resistant to that antibiotic and then get in trouble. So an understanding of Darwinian natural selection is very important. Where is it important with respect to protein sequences? <laughs> now for example, since I told you that we can write down letters, I could write down four letters. W-O-R-D, it means word. Now if I change one letter here from D to E, I get the word more. It still makes sense. If I change the other letter, I get gone. If I now change this to M, I get gone. And if I change this to E, I get G. So what have I done now? I have switched one letter at a time. This is what the biologists will call a mutation. When we change one letter in the end, because it may change the amino acid, it goes. This is a mutation. And mutations happen all the time. Mutations can happen with UV radiation. Mutations can happen because of carcinogenic chemicals. So mutations are constantly happening in nature. Some mutations can just happen randomly. And therefore, DNA keeps getting altered. So no two people really have identical DNA. But many mutations are what are called synonymous mutations. They don't change the meaning. If you go back and look at the genetic code, you'll quickly see, if I change this last letter here, I still get the same amino acid. So there are synonymous mutations, 
and there are non synonymous relations. But what this clearly means is that we can slowly, by changing the letters, evolve for new sequences. And nature has had millions and millions of years in which to change these letters, and this is how the large number of protein sequences which we have in our bodies have in fact evolved over time. We will bear remarkable similarities in our biochemistry, in our protein sequences, to other organisms. Many, many of our proteins will be very similar to those in bacteria. Some of them may be even similar to those in viruses. And because of this, there is an underlying unity in biology and evolution really is the way we think of the creation of the very large number of life forms on Earth. But today, because of technologies, there is an overload of sequence data. There's just too much sequence data. Sometimes uh, one might feel that also with other kinds of information. There are too many newspapers. There are too many books. Or nobody can claim to have read everything that is printed today. You can't even claim to read everything that was printed last year. And you certainly can't claim to read everything that's ever been printed. And therefore one always wonders what does one do. But I want to tell you because I think for a general audience it's very important to understand the pace at which biological research has really been moving. Biological research may not have contributed as much to our understanding of disease as it should. It may not have contributed as much as it should to our curing of disease. But at the same time, it has generated such a large amount of information that we must use that information to further our understanding of disease and our possible cures in the future. But look at the time when this exponential and in fact explosive growth in the number of protein sequences have gone. This here, I can't read it very well, but this is around 2005-2006. You can see that it was around 2005 middle that I became the director of the Indian Institute of Science. And sometimes when I look at a graph like this, it's a sobering thought to imagine that when I'm spending 80% of my time in administrative work, that's precisely the time when there has been an explosion of scientific information in the field in which I would like to work. <laughs> so you can see how far back a scientist can in fact become because of the inability to keep pace with this explosive growth of information. But one can do various kinds of things to find out where is this information coming up with the 20 letters that I showed you, what is the frequency of occurrence of those 20 letters. One can do a lot of what one calls a statistical analysis of the data which is there, which is the field, which is the growing field of bioinformatics. This has all become possible because of the revolution in computers. Now there are two revolutions which have taken place simultaneously. There's the revolution in biology and there's the revolution in computers. The computer revolution is known to all of you. The biology revolution is much less apparent. But the biology revolution would not be possible to use unless this expansion of computing uh, capabilities were. Well, these are the two most famous journals in science that you can see that periodically one genome or the other has fallen on the covers of these journals. That means the entire genome has been sequenced. Now hundreds of genomes have now been sequenced. There is a phenomenal amount of data there. How does one make sense of this data? And sometimes as I have grown older, uh, one worries about this. And then you're pleased to find that there are other people who are growing older in the literature who also worry about it. And this is a colleague at the California Institute of Technology, uh, Frances Arnold, who wrote this very interesting article where she, where she says, the library of Maynard Smith. Maynard Smith is the man who wrote that little paper which I had projected where he transformed one word into another. And then how does she try? She draws attention to a little short story. And this short story was written by the Argentinian author, George Luis Borges. 
He wrote this in the 1940s. It's a very short story. Anybody can read it. It's there available on the internet. So those of you who are interested can go back, put his name, and uh, put the title here, The Library of Babel, which I will show you in a moment. This is Maynard Smith, who wrote what I referred to already. This is Borges. This article appeared a couple of years ago. And this is the story. The title of this is The Library of Babel. And uh, this really it refers to a library in which there is effectively an infinite collection of books. But only one of those books really contains the true meaning of the universe. All the other books are devilish. Now the question is, how would you find this book? And uh, what is a thing is he says, I have wandered in search of a book, what he calls perhaps the catalogue of catalogues. He describes his life. He says the library is a sphere whose exact center is any one of its excellence and whose circumference is inaccessible. Which really means that it just stretches out into space infinitely. He then describes the library precisely. Five shelves for each of the hexagons wall. Each shelf contains 35 books of uniform format. Each book is of 410 pages. Each page of 40 lines. Each line, etc., etc., etc. It's a very precise description. I would urge those of you who are interested to go and read it. The result of this precise description is you will find on the internet any number of artists, etc., to what the library of Edel would look like. It would, in fact, look like this. Will be infinitely stretching out, and the books will be aligned in these shelves, and the librarians will be searching in all those shelves, the scholars, trying to find the book that holds the secret of the universe. It also turns out that Borges' precise description of his library also has led mathematicians to write books. There's a book called The Unimaginable Mathematics of Borges' Library of so you can find out, you could ask how many books are there, how many letters are there. This is precisely the kind of questions that we are asking of the human genome. There are over 3 billion letters in the human genome. And your genome and my genome now are different. And now we know there are 6 billion uh, uh, human beings on the planet. We know there are millions of microorganisms on the planet which differ to one another. We would eventually one day have all their genomes. How would we make sense of all of this? Of course, the librarians and the scholars who work in the library of Babel eventually look like this. And they also, occasionally, there will be librarians who work despite the fact that the skeletons of their predecessors still lying on their tables are completely unclear. So there are many philosophers and others who have read Borges' short stories and come to their own interpretation. I draw your attention to it. You can go to the internet, read the story for yourself, and a very few pages, it's only about six or seven pages, so it doesn't take very much time to read it. But you have to keep reading it, and each time you read it, uh, you sometimes feel a little bit more depressed uh, than you did uh, the previous time uh, you read it. But uh, it's interesting. But protein characteristics are these, they fall into precise three-dimensional structures, they interact with one another, they recognize other molecules, and these are all the problems that biochemists struggle with today. How does sequence relate to structure? How does sequence relate to function? I won't bore you with the growth of this, but what proteins do is they catalyze chemical reactions. And since they catalyze chemical reactions, they control chemical reactions, they control the entire chemistry of a living cell. And therefore, cells wouldn't be alive if they didn't have all these proteins uh, doing their business. And if you look at cellular chemistry, it looks something like this. You can't see it very well. There are thousands. With the lights out, you might see this, but... Uh, can you see these lights out? You can keep those lights on. 
my arm. Even then, I don't think you can see it over here because it's too much light, but there, there are just billions of things there. These look exactly like the bundle map. So one place connected to another through a pathway. And what the biochemists call a pathway is what we would call a road. And uh, there are main roads, there are side streets, uh, there are dead ends, uh, there are all kinds of things uh, which one has here. And deciphering them is a newly developing subject of what is called systems biology. But then one can ask in biology, how many chemicals are there? How many molecules are there? I did this some time ago, a few months ago, to find out how many chemicals there are in all. There's a counter on the internet with chemical abstracts, and you can see it's a very large number, uh, which is already known. So we're getting down with staggering numbers. If you sit with this counter, I sat one day for five minutes between 7 and 7, 5 p.m., and then found that this counter moved from 836 to 922. I now know how many uh, molecules were added in that period of time to the chemical abstracts database. I could extrapolate this, I could try this in different months, see whether it moves slower during Christmas and uh, so on, and uh, come to various interesting conclusions. But biochemistry itself has many fascinating aspects which are controlled by genes and proteins. Here is an old example from 1969. I've taken this example this, because this is an example of a field which is now becoming important in India called chemical ecology. There's a name, there will soon be departments, uh, there will soon be articles in newspapers, but the field is called chemical ecology. But this paper in 1969 is a paper which really marks the beginning of chemical ecology. When I saw this, I felt a little bit unhappy because I wish I had recognized this in 1969 because that was the year I went to the United States to do my PhD. And if I had known that this was important, maybe I would have gone and worked with the man who founded this field and then I would have very quickly been at the beginning of a scientific revolution. And uh, sometimes these revolutions are not immediate. It takes some uh, decades to happen. But to be there at the beginning is always uh, very useful. Now there is this beetle. And uh, if this beetle is uh, attacked, it produces this spray. This spray actually keeps at bay all kinds of predators, including ants. But this spray is actually like fire. It's actually a little burst of fire which is sprayed on the target. And it does this by mixing chemicals from vesicles which it contains. And all this is triggered off by a signal when a prey, uh, when a predator approaches. It's a remarkable explosive discharge and this biochemistry happens, happens at 100 degrees centigrade which this beetle is able to produce. Now this paper, which appeared in 1969, now of course has much more evidence by 1999, but what is interesting in 2007 and 2012, this paper is now being referred to in Proceedings of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, Journal of Power and Energy. Because when we are talking about problems in energy and so on, we are looking for biological leads. Because nature has solved some chemical problems in a much more sophisticated way than we are able to solve in the laboratory as chemists. So a lot of future advances in other fields will be inspired by an understanding of the biology. More recently, for example, as we did the molecules, for example, which this kind of uh, beetle uses against native competitors have been identified. Very simple molecules which then are used in very complicated biological situations. But how are these molecules produced? These molecules can be only produced by the action of proteins which synthesize them. 
And these proteins in turn can only be produced by the information which is contained in the genes which are carried by these organisms. So the genes now contain all the programs for survival of the organism in the environments in which the organism finds itself. And over the course of evolution, the genes now carry mutational events which allow Darwinian natural selection to operate. Here, for example, before he died, the author of the 1969 paper which I showed you, uh, Thomas Eisner, uh, he wrote a book called The Fallout of Insects, but he said new disciplines arise by a conversion of interest. Chemical ecology is the, partner, is the product of a partnership between biologists and natural product chemists united by shared vision and empowered by complementary skills. What is that vision? The vision stems from the realization that all organisms emit chemical signals and that all in their respective ways respond to the chemical emissions of others. And this is true everywhere. The cells in your body respond to the chemicals secreted by other cells. So your cells are constantly in communication. At the same time, when you look outside, if the butterfly heads towards a particular flower, it is responding to the chemical signals from the flower. If the flower is doing something, it is responding to the chemical signals that come from the butterfly. And therefore, even for students, the distinctions for students, faculty, teachers, everybody, the distinctions between chemistry and biology are soon be removed. Arthur Kornberg used C.P. Snow's uh, famous phrase, the two culture. Uh, Snow used this in a Cambridge lecture to, dis to describe the rift between the humanities on the one hand and the sciences on the other. Uh, Kornberg uses it here to discuss the rift between chemistry on the one hand and biology on the other, and today I think that rift is disappearing. In my own research, I work on such biological problems. I thought I would very quickly mention one of them. For example, this organism, which is a marine constant, faces both predators and prey. It can't move. It needs to eat. At the same time, it needs to defend itself. So the way it does this is it produces uh, venom. It coats an, an organ with the venom and then throws it out. This way it's able to immobilize its food, if it's going to eat fish or worms. At the same time, it can also make predators go away from it by uh, sort of paralyzing them to some extent or making them feel uncomfortable. It does this by producing large numbers of molecules. It's genetically programmed to do this. And my colleague, Professor Krishnan, uh, who passed away a few weeks ago, was the man who really began this project by collecting uh, cone shells from fishermen who got them in their nets off the coast of Tamil Nadu. Uh, and uh, Robert Lewis Jane said, said this many years ago. I do not know in what context he said this, but he said it's better to collect shells because you can be on the beach all the time uh, rather than uh, be a millionaire. But once the venom is isolated, one can analyze the molecules by the new techniques which are available. And I thought I would just show you one new method which we are doing, which tells you why I'm interested in genes. You can now extract from this venom, you can extract what is called messenger RNA and convert this into DNA. Once you have that DNA with you, you can now break that DNA into a large number of pieces and quickly sequence them. You break them into pieces which are all 99 letters long. And then you have billions of these 99 letter things. And you now have to match them together to make sense. At this point, this becomes a problem in computer science. And the computer scientists have addressed this problem. They have produced assembly programs using the formula which I showed you. A pairs with T, G pairs with C, but they must pair over a certain length. This is equivalent to taking a book and cutting out all the words and throwing them in and asking you to reproduce the book all over again. The question is, uh, how long would it take you to do this? Because you don't have any rules. You don't know what the author meant. But here we do have some rules, and therefore this becomes a possibility. And this is quite remarkable. 
And by doing this, one can put together all of these and get number of sequences like this. And we can now read sequences and then try to validate the sequences. I will go very quickly past this by using technologies which are now available. Eventually what happens is one can get a large number of useful molecules from this. But I thought I would end by showing you something which is very new. It, it surprised me. It surprises every technical audience. So I thought a general audience should also be surprised. Now for example, if you take a scientific paper, a scientific paper sometimes can have a large number of authors. And you might ask, which such? Because we are all used to thinking in science, in terms of Albert Einstein sitting, thinking about the universe, and then writing down uh, the special or general theory of relativity with only one author, A. Einstein. But it turns out that science, a hundred years after Einstein, doesn't quite happen that way. Today we need large teams of researchers. Now it turns out that the subjects in which you have the largest number of authors are subjects like particle physics. So if you are now hunting for the Higgs boson, you will have so many authors that the authors can't even be fitted onto a page of a journal and the print will be reduced and you have to use the magnifying glass to see who are the authors of the picture. The same thing is true with genomics papers which have very large number of authors. But I was rather surprised to find a paper in an area which described the molecules which are found in nature, which are genetically coded, produced as proteins, but subsequently modified by other processes, and this had over 65 authors. This is an area, it appeared in the journal, which usually carries papers in what is called natural products chemistry. Now, interestingly, natural products chemistry was a very important subject in India. And many years ago, in all the university departments, there were natural products chemists. Professor T. R. Seshadri, who was the head of the Delhi University Chemistry Department, before that the head of the Andhra University Chemistry Department, was one of the leading figures in natural products chemistry in the 1960s. But after the 1960s, natural products chemists had become extinct. Because all chemistry departments have decided that this is not an important area, so they have never taken people. And now because of that, the knowledge has also died. So sometimes old things come back again. It's like uh, never changing your trousers, because they will come back into fashion once again. <laughs> and uh, the same thing is true with ties. If you just keep the same ties that you have, one day you will be fashionable and after some time, you will be unfashionable all over again, it doesn't really matter. But this appears to happen also in scientific disciplines. When new technologies come back, old scientific disciplines are resurrected again, and this is happening in the natural product chemistry. And the way this happens is that whatever is encoded by genes and proteins is subsequently modified again by other proteins by doing chemical reactions on them. And so what you have what happens then is I might be able to recognize the string of letters, but I now can't recognize this chemical structure when I see it very easily. It would surprise technical audiences that a factor which was isolated in 1901 still doesn't have its structure determined in 2014. So it is still difficult to find out what they are. Some problems are so complicated that they have eluded uh, scientists for a long time. But this entire area of natural chemicals and natural products is something that is programmed in genes, in the enzymes, which proteins, which make these molecules. These molecules can be very important. This, for example, is a natural product called artemisin, which was uh, isolated by the Chinese in the 1960s. Uh, at the height of the Cultural Revolution. The leader of uh, one of the teams, Lady Yu Yu Chu, who's now, in the 19, who's now in her late 80s, was given the Lasker Award and she described this. This molecule was isolated during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. During the Chinese Cultural Revolution, Mao Zedong had sent all the scientists out to work in the fields. And the only scientists who were not sent to work out in the fields were given the task of finding an anti-malaria. Because the Chinese army was uh, worried that it would have to fight in the jungles of Vietnam 
and uh, malaria was uh, uh, prevalent there, and therefore they needed a drug which would now work on the malaria parasite. So they put battalions of people to work on extracting uh, all the plants which they had, and then testing these brutally in an assay with malaria infected mice. Eventually, they found that one extract appeared to work well, and this extract came from this plant, and what you had to do was to just extract this plant with two liters of water, rid out the juice, and drink the whole thing if you had malaria, and work like a charm. Question was, what was there in this? The molecule which was there was this one. But when you read her description of how they did the research, it's fascinating because they are under pressure, because if they don't find something useful, they might also be sent to work in the fields. And uh, today this too would not happen. But under this pressure, you try to find out about what's happening. The major problem was that the results were really reproducible. The way they were extracting from the plant was not reproducible. Why was it not reproducible? Because what chemists do when they get some or anything, is that they would put it into a flask, they would put some organic solvent on it and start boiling it from the bottom and make a decoction. Just the way you make it. And you extract the chemicals in this process. But it turns out that this molecule was extremely unstable. So she went back and read this old book, Chinese book, which appeared in 340 AD. And if you read the prescription there, it didn't say you should heat it. What it said was just keep it with cold water. And when they found the structure of the molecule, they found this. Even if there is one student of chemistry in this audience, if you take O, O, add an H there, and another H there, you will get hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide is an explosive. So the peroxide bond is very easily broken, and that was what was happening to this molecule. So this gave the first of, this is now, the first line anti-malarial in the treatment of drug-resistant malaria. Now there are many plant drugs which have come, and all these plant drugs that are listed here, including drugs which are now being actively sought for analgesics, which are non-addictive analgesics. And uh, the question of course is how are all these molecules made? All these molecules are made by enzymes which make them, and these enzymes, in turn, are produced by genes which code for them. So the information in the plant or the organism to produce these molecules is already inherent in the genetic program. So really, I will conclude by showing you a few quotes. Uh, Kornberg uh, said this for molecular biologists, but he really says here, and this is what I wanted to leave you with, he said, much of life can be expressed in chemical language. Chemistry links the physical and biological sciences, the atmospheric and the earth sciences, and the medical and the agricultural sciences. Chemical language is rich and fascinating and creates images of great aesthetic beauty. The real problem with chemistry, like with mathematics, is that it's a language. And unless one learns the language, one finds it difficult to converse and to write it. I have great difficulty uh, in saying more than one sentence which I have not thought about in Canada, despite many years of being in Bangalore. And I always feel apologetic about this. But the same thing is true when one learns other languages. Sometimes one is immersed in a language that you're interested in. Here I've been immersed really in chemical language. The other thing about sequencing. This was written by a very famous microbiologist, Carl Wies, who died some time ago. He said, Sanger's sequencing revolution, that is sequencing DNA, began as a technological exercise within a strictly molecular mechanistic context, has proven itself an evolutionary... Uh, uh, I will switch off. Suddenly found... Uh, that one. Doing it here. So he really, you really have to ask this question, Evan, what does the word evolutionary Trojan horse mean? It means that by getting these sequences, we really now are being diverted 
into the study of biological evolution, although that's not why we sequenced uh, DNA at this time. Where is nature to be found? Carl Reeves said this very well. He said, nature is to be found in her entirety, nowhere more than in her smallest creatures. And he quoted from the old literature of the West, Pliny the Elder, and this means that in the microorganisms that we do not see, of whom there are millions on Earth, you can find remarkable biological diversity, and therefore remarkable genetic and chemical diversity. And this is where many of biology secrets will really lie. But will this be useful? This will be very useful, for example, here is a paper which has just appeared in December 2013 on how, on the discovery of a protein which is used by bacteria to convert carbon dioxide to formate. And this really suggests there might eventually one day be a microbiological solution to the problem of hydrogen storage. And if one can store hydrogen, then of course one can in fact solve the problems that we have now with energy. I will quote Sidney Brenner, the man who actually told us how to translate genes into proteins and one of the figures behind the early molecular biology revolution. He said two things disappeared in 1990. One was communism, the other was biochemistry. And that only one of these should be allowed to come back. <laughs> Brenner, of course, was an extremist in everything that he wrote and did. But he also added now in the year 2000, we do not have to resurrect biochemistry and it will flourish because it provides the only experimental basis for a causal understanding of biological mechanisms. But finally, one can't do better than to go back and look at something said a very long time ago. Uh, someone sent me a book they sent me this book, Circulation, William Harvey's Revolutionary Idea, which was a biography of William Harvey, the discoverer of uh, blood circulation. But the book itself had in its uh, front page a quotation from Oscar Wilde. And this was a long time ago. This was actually in the 19th century. What Oscar Wilde said was, in this age we are so inductive that our facts are outstripping our knowledge. There is so much observation, experiment, analysis, so few wide conceptions, we want more ideas and fewer facts. Biology today, especially in genomics, has reached the stage that we have far more sequences than we can make steps of. We are, in fact, like the librarians in uh, Orger's Library of Weber, and this is what my colleague in the United States uh, used uh, uh, the metaphor so wonderfully. And therefore one needs to think about these sequences and one needs to ask the question, what is the kind of useful information that can be extracted from these which will eventually provide us some unifying concept which will take biology on its next step forward. Thank you very much.